You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. This interview was pre-recorded before the launch of Mary Gilliman's new book, John Gilliman, The Man, The Myth, The Movies, now available on Amazon. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and as always, I'm joined by Tom. Hello, everyone. It's Tom from England. I'm a huge fan of John Gellerman's films, in particular Rapture, which struck a chord with me, and I'm excited to discuss uh, much of his work today. Saul? Hi, it's Saul from Australia. I've seen 19 films by John Gilliman, and my favourite film of his is Death on the Nile. And Adam? Hi, this is Adam. I watched Rapture in the summer, and since then I've watched many of John Gellerman's films, and I've become a, a really big fan, and my favourite film is also Rapture. For this episode, we have a very special guest for you, Mary Gilliman. The wife of the late John Gilliman, who was the director of massive hits such as The Towering Inferno, King Kong, and the original Death on the Nile. But he is also the director of a beautiful and incredibly overlooked black and white film from 1965, Rapture. And it is this film that in some ways made this conversation happen. Rapture, tragically overlooked at its time, became an instant fan favorite at ICMforum.com. I mean, it's it's almost incredible how it happened from one user seeing it, posting a picture, simply showing the beautiful black and white cinemascope visuals, as well as a quick review, to just more and more people seeing it, sharing their reviews, sharing the visuals, until almost every single regular had seen it. I mean, this is really a community love story come true. Every year, we do a top 500 list covering obscure films and rapture of course, has made it onto the top 10 year after year after year. It is one of our very favorite films and also part of the forum identity that we will continue to champion. And it is through this that Mary found the review of our very own Tom, contacted him and revealed four things that made us extremely excited. One, that Rapture, among all of his gigantic films, was actually John's very favorite of his own work. Two, that she is writing the first comprehensive book on her husband and his work. Three, that two of the chapters will be dedicated to Rapture. And four, that she will come on talking images. In this episode, Mary will tell us all about her upcoming book, which I'm sure many of our listeners will be very excited to have on their bookshelves. Talk through Rapture, John's journey as a director, and if you are nice, she might even share a couple of stories that did not even make it into the book. So yeah, I'm so incredibly happy to have you here with us today, Mary. And we have so many questions uh, for you. So does our listeners, by the way. We have a few listener questions for you as well. But let's start with the basics. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the book you have been working on. Okay, well, the first thing to know about the book is it is a, a a work of community because there are eight contributors who are doing it for the love of John's films and uh, and myself. I'll stay on that now. <laughs> I've started on that track. After John died, I thought I've got to do something about this. There are no books about his work. This is a major figure in film, a uh, un- major unrecognized figure in film. He did like 38 films. And there was nothing until his death, there was nothing in print about him except a few paragraphs about his admittedly, this is true, bad temper. And after his death, the entry on Wikipedia was more full because they had the obituaries to draw on. So right away, pretty much, I started thinking, how can I get a book about John into the world? And I wrote to Neil Sinyard, who is the editor co-editor of a wonderful series that should not have ignored John called British Filmmakers. And he said, oh, yes, that's a wonderful idea. John's very underappreciated. But don't go with British filmmakers. They're very, very slow. We've been slow, of course, because it's five years later on in September that John died. But there you go. It's a difficult project to pull off. So he supported me right from the beginning. And he asked around among his film academic friends. And I looked for people. And um, that's we ended up with eight contributors, 
And you'll be pleased to know that there are actually three chapters on that chapter. We have a chapter, I'm going to forget her last name, but a chapter by a film academic called uh, Melanie something, <laughs> um, which is, if you like, a, the way that film chapters are often done, telling the story and then giving her take on it. We have a chapter by Brian Hoyle, who teaches at the University of Aberdeen, film there, and he's written a wonderful chapter about how John uses the camera. Uh, and then I've written a chapter called Viewing Rapture in the Era of Hashtag Me Too, to address directly the fact that there's a very big age difference between the two stars. And I've done it from the point of view of someone who was groomed by a high school teacher and I'm open about my own experience there and say Rapture was a healing film and I look at why was Rapture healing of my personal trauma why was it healing when it's portraying factually a similar situation and I'll go back to the first part of your question I met John when I was 45 and he was 72, and it, it was uh, amazingly love at first sight. One of my most vivid memories is when I came to, we met at around Easter 98, and when he was over in London, and I came for a, a brief visit in May 98. And I, my most vivid memory is standing in the kitchen listening to him tell him stories and he's telling me about his friendship with Steve McQueen and Fred Astaire and I'm going I'm looking at him and I'm thinking you know he's quite lined at 72 as many people are and I'm looking at him and I think god this is gorgeous looking man old but gorgeous <laughs> telling me about Steve McQueen and Fred Astaire like Fred Astaire was like huge favorite my friends and I watched his films over and over again you know his dancing films and so I was very starry eyed uh, and kind of amazed and what I thought in that moment was I'm not going to be too big for this man uh, you know I was uh, very I've always been an intense person and I often rather intimidated then and after he died I thought oh I got, kind of got that the wrong way around. I was, he saw that I was a big enough personality for him. He was a larger than my personality. And he wisely said to me, don't marry an old man. I'm impossible. <laughs> and I'm an old curmudgeon and things that were true. But uh, I was, because he was honest about himself and in the book, talking of honest about himself, the first chapter is a paper he wrote in 1990 after he nearly died due to an emergency operation. And he is so honest about himself. And um, I won't give anything away. <laughs> but it's really great start to the book. And um, I was going to say, because he was honest about himself, we uh, navigated and negotiated around the fact that, you know, he had had a lot of trauma. He did drink too much. He did have a bad temper. Take that all as read. Uh, he was amazing and wonderful and so passionate about life to the very end. You know, he, he, he get excited watching snooker, his famous, uh, his favorite, sorry, game on, on TV or tennis. Not as excited, but we spent hours when he wasn't very mobile watching snooker and tennis together. When we played pool up until in the pool room up until two weeks before he died, which was very sudden. And he'd still bang his cue on the floor and he did a good shot. And, you know, he was just a person with the most life that I've ever known. And I'm so grateful to have spent. Um, 17 years with him, which I didn't know I'd get that long, of course, meeting him when he was 72. So he was a very special person. I'm really, really happy that we're only a few months off this book, which, just say one more thing before my long speech ends, but um, it will be probably the most unusual film book that's been published because it has his autobiographical 
take on himself in which is incredibly honest about things like his bad temper and what, you know, the psychological things behind that. And then because of my contribution about, you know, who remember the book, well, the book's called John Gellerman, The Man, The Myth, The Movies. And the myth part is, for me anyway, debunking this, uh, he's only a bad tempered old so and so thing and showing what a complex and wonderful personality he was. And I'm very, I follow his lead. That in his unpublished article, he was incredibly honest. I follow his lead. I'm really honest about his faults and about his, how he was in private, how loving he was, and how loyal he was. Um, so is that there's going to be a real, for fa- fans of his work, there's going to be a lot of satisfying material actually getting to know him a bit as well as getting to know some of his films we couldn't cover them all obviously well that was absolutely wonderful mary what what other films will be included let me just tell you that when you were saying how it built up tom had told me a little bit of that but how it built up about people uh, liking rapture and it getting to the top 500 every year when i from the moment i first knew john he would say my best film was Rapture, and only about half a dozen people had seen it. And it was, he was heartbroken about that. He, he didn't like any of his other work until I started collecting them and we looked at them together and he'd go, hmm, not bad. <laughs> by, by the time he died, he was reconciled to his work. He was much happier about his work. And that was partly because of the wonderful Nick Redman and Judy Kergo. They had it on their, when they started Twilight Time, which released his old, old films, they had Rapture on their radar even before I saw they were launching Twilight Time and, and, and John wrote to them and they were already uh, after Rapture. And the recognition it got once it was released on Blu-ray and DVD really warmed the last few years of John's life. Because he knew it was his masterpiece, and it was, is. And that's not what you asked me. What did you ask me? <laughs> oh, other films. Okay, yeah, so the no, book's no, laid no. out like this. The, the, books, the book's laid out like this. We begin with John's paper. Then there's, uh, this is the probable order. Then Neil Sinyard wrote about um, some of John's early films. So he wrote about a bit about, it's mostly about Never Let Go, which is a wonderful 1960 thriller that's kind of out of time, I think. Not oh, really dated. And um, he kind of took the line about how, uh, what a good director of actors John was. The um, performances he got out of Richard Todd in uh, Never Let Go, the performances he got out of Peter Servilers in Never Let Go and Wolf of the Toreadors. I think there's another film mentioned in there, but the main focus is Never Let Go. Then uh, Kate Lees is the granddaughter of Arthur Dent, who was the British film industry person who supported John in his early years as a director. And she still owns the Delphi studio that John did all the five films with. So she and someone called uh, Vic from the, forgotten his second name for the moment, from the British Film Institute have written a chapter about the not just John's involvement, but what was happening to British cinema in that period, late 40s, early 50s, how the Odeon and ABC had all the distribution sewn up and how hard it was for independent studios like Adelphi to make a dent on that market. So it's like almost like a sociological review as well as looking at John's contribution to that period. And then I've written a paper called John Gilliman, A Lover of Femininity in All Its Fullness, something like that, the title is. And I look at how... how un- I mean, this is interesting, right? I knew John liked me for being feminine, and I knew that he also loved my strength. And I told you I'm a psychotherapist. I have a whole theory about the way the human psyche works that I just said, I cannot say I have a masculine part. I am not going to give away my strength and power to say I have a masculine part. I perceive women as having a strong side that is different from male strong side. So I developed this way of looking at 
human beings that is, I'll keep brief about this, but it's relevant to John. I talk about having the solar feminine and lunar feminine, solar masculine and lunar masculine. It's basically um, active and powerful is the sun, solar side, and quieter and at rest is the lunar side. I didn't realize how strongly John and I shared a vision of the fullness of femininity after he'd gone until I was writing this book when I was really writing this chapter I thought this is you know it's extraordinary this he had this whole vision that that I laid out in my paper right in I'll give you a good example right in his first film he was 24 years old he has the that's called torment or paper gallows and there's uh, two brothers who are kind of crime writers and the secretary housekeeper and the brother that she does end up marrying at the end of the film or she's going to marry him i should say uh he says to her um joan what are you going to do when you leave us and she says oh i, I don't know i'm drift around until i find something interesting and he says aren't you going to get married and she's i can't remember if it's that dialogue now but she says why on earth quite sharply she says what on earth makes you think I would want to get married? He said, uh, he said, well, I thought that's what all women wanted. And Joan says, oh, sometimes you're really dense, Jim. Well, this, he made that in 1949. The whole of the 50s, women were expected to be ideal uh, uh, mothers and wives. In 1949, <laughs> someone telling the, the hero that he's stupid because he thinks all women wants to get married. So I think he had an extraordinary, um, extraordinary perceptiveness into uh, into how women feel and react. And I won't give away why I think that because it makes reading his his autobiographical essay more more interesting if I don't give it away. But um, he 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 was one of a kind of a person. He was re really amazing person. I think Rapture shows that right. Rapture shows what an incredible person he was. Yes, without a doubt, an incredible director as well. Oh, Christopher, I just remembered I, I lost my way. I was telling you about the films. I am. Yes. I, do get a bit, I, I do get a bit enthusiastic about John. Um, okay, so that's the early yeah. section. Then, then the middle section is devoted to Rapture. So there's the three I've already described, the three chapters I've already described. No other film gets more than one chapter. Oh, I've forgotten. There's, uh, we do a little short thing, Neil and I, between us. We do the two children's films John did. That's in the early section, too. After the rapture section, there's um, a reprint of an article from Film Comment by Olaf Muller, who is an international film critic. And when John read that article, 2013, he was still with us, he said, this man really gets my work. So um, we've included that with permission from Film Comment. And then the last section of the book, perhaps predictably, covers the three blockbusters. So there's a chapter each on uh, Death on the Nile, King Kong, and Towering Inferno. And I heard that John doesn't actually, or didn't actually like the Towering Inferno at all. Is that true? Oh, it's really true. Erwin <laughs> um, Allen was very fired up by his success with the Poseidon adventure and he fought really hard. There were two books that came out very close together about a skyscraper going on fire and um, I won't go into the details because that's in, in the paper that uh, that um, was written about Towering Inferno by Bret Hart who's, that's an interesting story because he's not a film academic or critic He's a huge fan of John's who was inspired to be a director because of, I think it was King Kong and Towering Inferno. And um, we met accidentally. And so he said, I'll write, I'll write about Towering Inferno for the book. So, so that John would have really liked that to have a fan write a book and not just a critic. I've forgotten the question that I was following again. No, we actually, we actually got all the way to the end now. You summarized your book perfectly. <laughs> so yeah, I know. I was, I was gonna tell, I was gonna add something though. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll um, let it ride if you don't remember either what, what track I was on. <laughs> oh, Towering Inferno. But uh, I think Adam. On the oh, Towering. Why, why didn't, why yeah. he didn't like it? 
Yeah. So Ir- Irwin Allen wanted to direct Towering Inferno, and he'd arranged this joint deal because there were two companies after the the film, the books, and the studios knew enough not to let him. But they made this really difficult arrangement. They gave John the direction of the actors and Irwin Allen the direction of the uh, action sequences. And uh, John would, one of the things I loved about John was that things that hadn't gone the way he wanted in the film industry, he'd still tell stories about them with huge passion right up until his death. So he'd go, I tried to persuade Irwin Allen to use four cameras. So you could really cut and get, you know, beautiful fire action scenes. And in order to try and get him to do it, because there's rough editing, as you can imagine, you know, I drew up the storyboard of how it could be done. And he wouldn't use four cameras, he'd only use two. And then John would hold his hands out and suddenly say, and the fire sequence is just cruel. Like he gets so passionate about how slow <laughs> the fire sequences were, which no one else for him says, but he had this vision that wasn't fulfilled. And so he did. He had a terrible time on on set. I mean, he he, he loved the actors, especially Steve McQueen. But it, that you know, he liked to be in control, and so did Erwin Allen. So we don't need, need to say any more about that. You can imagine how hard that was for, for both of them. And Erwin Allen uh, tried to say he was the director of the film when it was finished, and John uh, took it to the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, and, and won the right to be called the director to the film. But that's how bad that part of it was. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that that working on the Towering Inferno was such a poor experience for our John, especially because it's such a well-known film now. I do actually agree with John that it's far from his best work, and especially because he did the movie Skyjacked a couple of years before Towering Inferno, which might have helped him win the contract on that. And Skyjacked yeah. is just yeah. such a dynamic disaster film. It's not just a disaster film, it's a mystery, and they're also they're trying to work out who the bomber is. It's like very different to Airport, which came out a couple of years before that. It gets really intense towards the end, and was, I don't know, I found it a very powerful film when I was re-watching Skyjack, compared to when I re-watched mm-hmm. Towering Inferno. And I might even say on Towering Inferno that I actually find the um, burning sequence in Adventure in the Hot Fields is actually more enticing for me. And I found that much mm-hmm. more intense than pretty much anything in the Tower Inferno. Well, there you go. I mean, um, Julie Kergo, um, the person who writes screen notes for Twilight Time, was hoping to do an essay on Towering Inferno because she says it's what the best of the disaster genre. But um, she wasn't able to do that because of Nick's illness. But... From the point of view you're saying it, that's really interesting because there's no question it's not John's best film, even if it might be one of the best disaster films. So I think you've... I haven't actually seen the fire sequence in Adventures in the Hot Field because I bought a copy on Amazon and it stopped working just before the fire scene. So I've only seen most of Adventure in the Hot Field. But um, so I think that's really perceptive what you just said, and John would have have um, uh, agreed with you if he was here to hear it. Thank you. It's good. To know. Hi, Mary. Um, like like Saul, I've seen nineteen films as well, and I find it really interesting how you're talking about femininity, um, because actually my top three favourites are uh, Rapture, Thunderstorm, and An Adventure in the Hot Fields, and mm. all. Um, all of them has have a female character as the main actress in it. I'm really interested in if you've seen Thunderstorm or if you know what John's opinion was of it, because it's one of our favourites now, having recently watched it. Right. Um, I've, I do. I have seen Thunderstorm. I do write about that in my look at his attitude to femininity. Um, he 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 didn't talk about thunderstorm very much in his collection of stories i remember him saying telling me about a time when this is not about the film (laughs) i remember him telling me about when linda christian used to (laughs) 
sunbathe nude on the beach and all the crew would really enjoy looking at her. Um, but he he didn't t tell me much about the actual making of it. But I expect you'll find that bit of my paper interesting. I do look at that and take a few paragraphs to look at that. Are, are you able to tell us, I don't know if you'd rather save it for the book, but are you able to tell us what you thought of the portrayal of her character? Yeah, um, well, I, I I trace this in a few films of John's, that the way that, that you may not have seen Four Days, if you haven't, it's produced by renowned pictures. You, you should see that. That's interesting in light of what I'm going to say as well. But in Four Pictures, the the wife, the bored wife of a busy um, businessman is so bored she's adulterous and she even thinks about murdering her husband. And in Thunderstorm, there's men just fall for the lead character, Maria, and, and fight over her, like really viciously. And they have wherever she's been. She warns people that she brings trouble. In the conventional 1950s films, those two characters would have been cast in a, a negative light. You know, you weren't supposed to be an adulteress and even think about murdering your husband in, in 1950s films. You're supposed to be an ideal wife and mother, and you're not supposed you're going to be to blame if men want to fall all over you and want to um, fight over you. And John doesn't. And in Thunderstorm, the whole village blames. Uh, I can't remember that name, something like Magdalena. There was a film about a much, you know, 10 years ago or something about a beautiful woman who collaborate, you know, who was provided sexual services to the Germans and the whole village attacks her and rips her clothes off. It's a bit like a later version of what happens in Thunderstorm. And um, neither of those films in, not only do not blame the female protagonist, but the critical eye is cast on uh, in the first one four days i say first because he did it earlier you are led to sympathize with her about her boredom and stultifying life and in thunderstorm if you're open to seeing it because it's not explicitly stated if you're open to seeing it you can see that she is uh, almost like she's the victim the storyline says look at all the destruction she wreaks but she's like the still center of this storm of male lust and desire for domination and that's how it filmed that it's uh, the way men are <laughs> that uh that produce this result and i do think that's one of the incredible you know i think really he was a poet and a visionary as much as he was a filmmaker but because he didn't get enough recognition which was a lot to do with his tendency to argue with uh, the people with power he didn't get the opportunities he could have had so that kind all that early promise in you know people who like john's work once they found his early films they can see where he could have gone after rapture if he'd had more power to make the films he really wanted to make because his artistic unusual vision of life shows in his early films much more than in his later films even though they're lovely in their own way, especially Stefan Lars, a favourite of mine. But his amazing work is, is in the films up to Rapture, really. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, what you said about Thunderstorm is, is, that, is actually exactly what I was thinking. Um, you know, I watched that film and I think the main character in it, I think she's portrayed as completely innocent and the rest of the town and the men are the ones who are causing all the problems so i definitely took it as her being the innocent one and it's very interesting that you mentioned about his earlier films compared to his later films because i haven't watched death on the nile yet that's the next one i'm planning to watch but of the ones i've seen and i've probably seen about half of john's films now a lot of my favorites i would say are the 50s and 60s so it's quite interesting mm -hmm. to hear you talk about the artistic choices or his the lack of choices he might have had later on so yeah, I find that really interesting, the kind of perhaps a change in the types of films he made later on in his career. Well, well, let me say something about that, because he had a bit of an unusual attitude. He was quite modest, you know, he didn't believe he was handsome. I mean, he was handsome right up until he died, you know, and he always, until the last few years of his life, he always looked a lot younger. So he was like a really modest person. 
There's a really uh, um, important thing about Rapture that uh, Daryl Zanuck really wanted a film with Patricia Gosley in it for salubrious reasons, unfortunately. But Daryl Zanuck was a producer who left the director alone. John loved Daryl for letting him have the fulfillment of his artistic vision. He never came on the set. He never delivered those little producer notes that are the bane of filmmakers' lives. He let John completely enter into his vision of the film. And John was eternally grateful for that. Because what happened after that, in particular, is he moved to America. He had to follow the money. The Brit- American film, Americans invested in the British film industry during the war and after, and then the money gradually went away. And he couldn't sustain his, he felt he couldn't sustain his family if he stayed in, the, in Britain and in the British film industry. So he, he was able to go and, and work, you know, and actually live in, in Hollywood, um, not Hollywood, but live in LA. And, um, he told me he just took what work he was given because he needed to support his family. That's how he looked at it. He looked at himself as a provider. Um, he regretted the decision he made as in the 1950s to refuse to let his wife work because of them having children. He thinks that was, he thought that was a mistake of his, but he, you know, in the 50s, he made the decision that was a normal 1950s decision. So, so he, so he took, you know, he stopped her working as an actress. That's how they met. She was an actress in some of his films. And he took his responsibility as a father and husband really seriously. And he literally said, I took any job that came to me. And he has a nephew who's a filmmaker who held out for wanting to make his own stuff and so on, and has made, who's talented, but has made far much, I won't say his name, but has made far, you know, has made far fewer films because of, you know, that I'm not criticizing him. I'm just saying that that's his choice. But John would say to him, <laughs> when we were together, he'd say, take the work, you know, just do anything. You never know what opportunities are going to come. And, al- and although that's, true the opportunity that didn't come was the opportunity to develop what he had in rapture and yet i'm not saying i mean i i really enjoy kong and i really 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 like death on the nile because i'm a big Agatha christie fan anyway <laughs> but it's so sumptuous you know it's, it's beautiful it's really beautiful and, and and such fun he he managed to do good work but he he definitely wasn't able to do anything other than get glimpses of the artist in him and um sheena for example sheena queen of the jungle his son was killed in a car crash in the middle of filming that and so there are a number of reasons why it's a bit wobbly in the critics eyes one of which is using a horse painted like a zebra for the heroine to ride but he sat me down to watch Sheena because he said, I want to show you the bit. Oh, he's on cry. I want to show you how, where I, I can't remember how he put it, but he's basically saying, I tried to put my artisticness in. I want to show you where I was trying to be artistic. And he would talk about the wildlife scenes at the opening and what it felt like getting the shots of the flamingos flying off the lake and things like that. So, Poor John. <laughs> he wasn't, didn't have quite the power to make the films he wanted to make, but he never stopped okay. trying to be artistic. And um, it's a bit sad to think what he might have done if he probably if he'd been a more even-tempered man. His best friend and producer, Christian Ferry, the first time we met in London in 1998, uh, he took me aside and said to me, if only John could have stopped fighting with all the producers and people with power. Who knows what he could have done, something like that. And this was uh, 10 years after John's very last film. He was, he, his friend was still caring that John had lost the chance to really fulfill his vision because he just couldn't resist being a pain in the neck to the people in power. <gasps> I think it's fascinating that you mentioned the shots of 
wildlife, Mary, because John works in some beautiful locations across the world. You've got Egypt and Death on Nile, New York and Hawaii for King Kong, and then places like Kenya for Tarzan's greatest adventure. Did John have a specific favourite location where he shot it all? Well, he did really love Kenya. That's where Sheena was shot as well. Uh, His wife grew up in Kenya, and so between the two of them, they had a a great love of, of Kenya. And when he was too old to be planning this, I said, you're too old, John, we can't do this. Well, with my bad back and, and, uh, and your age, we can't do this. What he did was he got in touch with the someone he really cared about in Kenya who led safaris. And he said, I really want you to see Africa. I, re-. I said, John, I'm not really interested in Africa. <laughs> he said, I really, I really want to take you to Africa and I want to go on safari. Like he was maybe 85 or 86. <laughs> Not sure. Uh, we didn't. We didn't do it. It was a, a, a pipe dream. But I would say uh, Kenya was his favourite location. And yes, he was very attached to the North Shore. That not, not the North Shores, Maui, where he. I think it was the North Shores of Maui, but where he. I think that's the right island for where he filmed uh, King Kong. He, uh, as I did, loved the countryside. He moved to Malibu to be out of Los Angeles, where he and I lived for the first six years of our marriage. And um, and then we moved to Topanga, which, if you haven't heard about it, is a very, it's kind of, um, it was originally, it's it's the first canyon out of L.A. And it's uh, wooded and mountainous, tons of wildlife. And that's, that's where we moved. And it was first populated by Mexican ranchers and what do you call them? Like there was a, a robber type person that, that hung out there. And then there were hippies in the 60s. And it's like a, a, a kind of semi Wild West place even now. <laughs> so that's where he ended up. That sounds brilliant, Mary. And it's also um, fascinating to think about the location shooting in Rapture uh, because of this stunning scenery of the, the gritty coast. It's like the perfect setting for the uh, emotionally charged coming of age tale. And his exquisite camera work kind of paints a, a powerful picture of a young girl coming yeah. to terms with her transition to womanhood. I mean, Rapture is a remarkable film, and I'm so pleased that I discovered it through the forum. And to learn that it is also John's favourite out of all the films he made, it's just brilliant. And I understand, Mary, that Rapture resonated with you on a personal level. And I would love to hear more about your experience watching. Right. Well, um, now when I watch Rapture, I don't quite understand why I had this feeling so strongly that I'm about to tell you. Because now I don't think it's... Well, what it was was that For about the first five times I watched the film, I couldn't tell. I was so into Agnes and her way of looking at things. I just, every time the film ended, I went, did she know the scarecrow was real? I don't know. I don't understand. Now I I can't regain that experience because she says, she tells us very clearly at the end, I always knew you were real. But the film cast such a spell on me that because of all the bits where she tells Dean Stockwell, no, you're mine. I, I, I made you. I brought you to life. Um, that cast such a spell on me that I really believed that reality more than that she knew he was a human being all along. So that was a very strong part of watching Rapture for me. But I had a very confusing time in my teenage years. I was very lonely. I didn't fit in the school I was in. And the high school teacher that paid me attention was about the only person that did, right, seemed to see me as as a valuable person. And when you're 15, you think things are consensual. So there was like a strong petting relationship. I don't know if you know that term. It might be a bit British, but not intercourse, in other words. And it went on for three years. And I I would feel very guilty because he was married. And I would try to break it off. And he would kind of seduce me with the way he looked at me back in. And 
unfortunately, it was the most intense sexual experience of my whole life because it messed up the, whole, the rest of my life in that way. But so I would have been, I might have been, you know, a less subtle, tender, sensitive film. I, I might have, uh, you know, by the time I saw Rapture, I had come to terms with the fact it's not consensual when you're 15. And just because nobody talked about sexual abuse in the 1960s, uh, that's what it was. So I had kind of gained a different perspective on my personal experience and had some anger around it. So I could have watched a film with that plot line and been incensed and recognized my own experience in that way. And instead what happened was, well, I just flashed in my mind on them running on the beach. It, Dean Stockwell's character played that part with such tenderness and genuine love of Agnes. I can't say it the French way, sorry. <laughs> um, that I would just have tears streaming down my face for maybe the first 10 times I saw the film. <laughs> uh, and I just felt that poor little 15 year old in me who was so confused. I've got tears in my eyes now saying it. Just, I felt a hell, I think, in a very tender way. Felt, I suppose, I've never really said this before, but I suppose felt recognized in the sensuality and sexuality that I, I had. Uh, as a 15 year old, but held, but nurtured and seen in all that, gawky isn't quite the right word, but seen in that kind of fresh and awkward phase of life, but held so beautifully by Dean Stockwell's character, who offset was very big brotherly to Patricia Gozzi. He was very protective of her. And as an adult, I have uh, put this in my paper on rapture have a little bit of discomfort with the fact that she was only 14 and a half during the filming when she was lying in bed with adult men so it's a bit difficult about the actress i think but in terms of the film i have watched that film in company with my women friends several of whom had uh, incest or sexual abuse history and no one's ever been upset by it. They've always been captivated by it. I just think that such testament to John's sensitivity and his understanding of something really eternal in the human in the human condition. Like I don't even having watched it so many times and even knowing the time it was made where there wasn't such a conscious awareness of the of the dark side of life. It's a little bit like a miracle to me that he could pull that off. That this, you know, Dean Stockwell was 29. You're not told how the character is, but he was 29. She was 17 and a half in the filming. And he pulls off, for most people, this ascendancy of, of tenderness and love over the discomfort of the large age difference. Um, I'd just like to ask a couple of very quick questions. So, you mentioned Patricia Gozzi, and another favourite on the forum is called, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's called Sundays and Sabelle. Yeah. That's the English title. Have you seen that film? Yes. I was just wondering what you thought of that, because I know that also deals with the relationship. Not, it's not a sexual relationship in the film, but a relationship between a young girl, Patricia Gozzi, and an older man. So I was interested in what you thought of that, if... I know it's not about John's film, so you don't have to. No, 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 of course. Uh, no, absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up. I nearly brought it up, but I thought I, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go on and on. But, well, I'd like to draw your attention and your listeners' attention to three videos that are on YouTube. They were made for the DVD version of Sundays with Sibel. There's an interview with Patricia Gozzi, an interview with Hardy Kruger, and one with the director, I'm going to get his name right, I forget his first name, but Borginon, Sergio Borginon, don't quite know how to pronounce it. They all, the director was absolutely clear that the relationship was pure and innocent. And Patricia Gozzi tells a story, I quote this in my paper on Rapture, that the day before the interview was filmed, which was must have been around 2014 when they did the 
DVD. She phoned her father and she, she said, I'm not going to remember the full dialogue, but she said, you know, uh, what did you think of me acting with such a much older man? And he said, no, no, it was good. I knew it was pure or something like that. It's a, it's a longer section than that I quote it in my paper. And he says something like, we didn't think about things in those days. What, you know, let's give it a name, paedophilia. Even though it's, it's a bit like rapture, even though it's in the film, that people in the film think it's paedophilia. The director and the actors and actress, the actor and actor were totally living inside this is a pure instant relationship. And because the, Hardy Kruger's character had been damaged by his Vietnam War experience. He is, in a sense, childlike. The film sees it more as the relationship between two children, with Patricia Gosley as the stronger character. She talks about that. She talks about being feeling that when she was filming at 12 years old, how she's the stronger character, the more mature character in the relationship. <laughs> you know, John said... No surprise here. John said she was the finest actress he ever worked with. And as with many other people, a little sad that she didn't choose that career path. But she hated acting. And um, he feels it was because her mother pushed her into acting. But this is a bit of an aside, I know. But she would uh, run away and hide in the caves before filming. And the whole crew had to go out and look for her before the filming could start. So that's some of the background to why she didn't stay in films. But what, you know, what an actress, my goodness. In both films, she's absolutely superb. Thank you. That was, that was really fascinating. Like I said, that Sundays in Seville is another of our favourites on the forum. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I viewed it kind of like you were saying, that it was an innocent relationship. I just wanted to know if... You have spoken to Patricia Gozzi, if you or if you know, if you've been in touch at any point with anyone that John worked with in terms of actors or actresses. I haven't spoken to Patricia Gozzi. I'm, 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 I don't know if I've got time now, but I'm interested in trying to contact her and see if she'd write a little, you know, paragraph or two for the book. But I haven't organised that yet. Did I? You know, I came along 10 years after he came into John's life, 10 years after directing gave him up, is how he put it. I didn't give up directing, directing gave me up. <laughs> so I didn't, I don't think I met anyone he filmed with. I met a few people he worked with, who crew of his and things. Uh, I held a memorial by showing Rapture in a, a local restaurant that had a hall in it. And a couple of people came all the way from North Carolina who'd worked with him on the ill-fated King Kong Live. So oh, now and again, I've, and I've met a lot of people who say to me, I became X in the film industry because I watched King Kong or Towering Inferno. Those are the ones that come up. I watched them as a child and I knew I wanted to be in that world. And I, I mean, I say a lot, but it's probably only six people, but it's still interesting how the, how they have the same story. The first film I ever saw was King Kong or Towering Inferno, and that made my mind up. I wanted to be a director, or I wanted to be an editor, or I wanted to be in the film industry somehow. Can I ask, Mary, because you bring up something very interesting about how John said that directing gave me up, and his last film was an HBO film with Chris Christopherson called the Tracker or Dead or Alive, as it's been released on yeah. DVD in Australia. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. I've seen, I've seen everything that's available. Okay, yeah. because I think Dead or Alive, or The Tracker, however you want to call it, is a very interesting comparison piece to Rapture because in both cases there's a young girl involved in some sort of possible lust thing so you've got the uh, Scott Wilson character in the trucker, and he likes her as he sees the uh, young god or whatever. He's like, oh, a princess. And he's, he spends, you know, half the film or whatever trying to convince his 12-year-old girl to love him. And he's the villain of the piece, and it's just a very different look at the um, younger girl, older man relationship to Rapture. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. 
Well, isn't that interesting? No, I didn't remember that. I've only seen it once, and um, I'm interested to see it again now you've said that. Uh, so I can't answer about the comparison. Yeah, I get, I, 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 I'll have to see it again. That's I can answer. I didn't see anything that. It's an interesting film, and I think, you know, John ended his career on a really positive note with that, because I know he had a few, you know, hiccups, I guess, maybe would say in the 1980s. But I think, you know, with Death on Nile and the, the trucker at the end there, I thought it was a really great end to the career. And the um, young girl subplot is really just a subplot in the tracker. It's mm -hmm. not the main part of it. The main part of it is about the Chris Christopherson character, but he is tracking down Scott Wilson, who are uh, amongst being just a murderer and everything, he's also a pedophile who has extreme interest right. in this girl whose father he just killed. Right. Yeah, sorry, that's okay. If you can't say much about it without it being fresh in memory, that's all right. I just thought it was a very interesting film and interesting comparison piece to Rapture. Well, there is an interesting insight into John as a director. Was I was told at his memorial, by one of the people who worked with him, that John was offered innumerable television parts to direct, and he refused them all. And if you look at his filmography on um, IMDb, you'll see that in those early years, he produced not only one or two feature films a year, but like quite a lot of television episodes. And um, for people interested in John, there's a fictionalized version of those early years written by his first wife. It's called... Mary Lacey, L A C Y, and she she um, turns John into a television director <laughs> because I think the early years of their marriage were like dominated by him working so hard in television as well as film. You know, it was just like never there. I think, and I f I found that interesting when I heard this new piece of information that. John was offered jobs, they just weren't feature films. And I think that part of the con, you know, if you, if you imagine that the timing's a bit different and John's career was ending in the 2000s, television had become prestigious again. It wasn't prestigious in 1988. And I think if the timing had been different, he might well have gone into television because a lot of uh, big directors have directed for these new luscious things on television. But in 1988, no, he wasn't going to go back to He never talked about this, but this is my guess. He wasn't going to go back to making television when he'd made big feature films. I guess he was modest, but also had his pride. <laughs> and that's how I read it, him not making films after 88, was he had his pride. That's fascinating to hear, Mary. And I'm also curious about how you mentioned earlier where John would take some directing roles just, just for the job. And I want to find out how he came about to directing Rapture. Was that something that he actively sought out? How did he become involved in that picture? Ooh, um, well, okay, so I'm not quite sure. I don't, I don't know if I know the story directly, but Christian Ferry was Daryl Zanuck's right-hand man in Europe, and he was the lead producer on The Longest Day, which, as you all know, was a really big hit. And Daryl was wanted to make the film with Patricia Gozzi, and he arranged for it to be recast uh, in Brittany and not in England, where the novel was set, so that so he could cast Patricia Gosby, who'd never acted in English before. She didn't know any English other than her lines in the film, which makes her performance even more remarkable because there's so much feeling in her English, but she didn't know any English except for the script. I suspect she picked up a bit while she was filming it. So my guess is that Daryl's interest in Patricia Gosby and Christian Ferry's close relationship with Daryl meant that probably Christian and that said John would be a good director for this script. That's my guess. I honestly had no idea she could not speak English, which, which is truly yeah. incredible. I mean, her performance in this film is you know, absolutely fantastic. Uh, so it's just, uh, she did that, all of that phonetically. It's incredible. Uh, and it, I suppose part of that is also just the way that 
John shot her because you, you can really feel in every single shot she's in, there's also this visual tension and this gorgeous black and white. And you see, you see her on clifftops, you see her in all of these gorgeous, but slightly unsettling and skewered shots as well. So it's just mm. the way he captures her inner life and the way he captures her aversion to sounds and the way, you know, he, he captures her mm. anxiety. I think that really makes that performance work even better than it would have otherwise. Yeah, and I mean, she had just done the one film. So John would describe to me things like the scene where she's lying on the floor telling Dean Stockwell how she was seen, how she was seen as a bit crazy. She didn't really know what to do with that scene. And it was John who said, um, well, why don't you just lie on the floor? And you remember the bit where... Well, you may not remember, it's just a little detail, but there's a bit where her hand is kind of trailing up the wallpaper pattern as she's talking. And it was John that thought of that and showed her, you know, you could do something like this. So he did give her quite a lot of direction. And one of the things that we're going to put in the book, which will be interesting to Rapture fans, is that I did have hundreds of photos of Rapture and unfortunately I gathered all my most precious things up in a box when I had to evacuate from the fire and I left them in a car outside the house I'm in now in Rosarito Beach and the whole box was stolen and it was dumped on the beach and I won't go into the story but I managed to get some of the contents back but most of the Rapture photos were gone. However, we do still have, I forget what they're called, they're sheets that have small repeated photographs that are taken while a film's been working on. And I have some photographs of John right up close with uh, either Dean Stockwell's stand-in while they were running things through, or I think it's mostly the stand-in, but right up close, adjusting people's posture. <laughs> he was very in there, director. So I'm going to put some of those shots in to show how he works like really right among the actors. i to hear that you lost many of the photos, Mary, but I'm kind of curious to find out if you have mementos of John's work on other films, if it was just specifically those from Rapture, which he treasured. Uh, yeah, no, I do have one. Uh, there's not many physical artifacts. It was mostly photos that John had retained, but there was one thing he was very, very proud of, which was a little biplane carved and glued, carved from scratch and glued out of some, I don't know if it's called balsa wood, but some kind of light wood. And James Mason made it for John during the filming of Blue Mac. And he always treasured that. And I treasure it, of course, and that I have that still for biplane. One thing I was really uh, fascinated by when I saw Thunderstorm as well is, is that there are actually sections to Rapture, both in the way it's shot, which is you not know, beautiful black and white with so much tension in every shot, but, but also this angle of this, look, this magical angle that it's very clear to the audience that the magic is not real, but it's still there and it's still such an integral part of the film. So in Thunderstorm, we have our lead who is sure that she's cursed and that men are drawn to her and she's causes, you know, death and destruction wherever she goes. And obviously in Rapture, Agnes genuinely believes, or, or at least in some way believes, or wants to present that she believes that her scarecrow came to life. And I think in both of these films, this magical element, this idea of this magical element, also plays a really important role in the film. It's just, mm. I, I think it's exactly the same thing as you in, in terms of how we reacted to Agnes and the scarecrow as well, because you really wonder, does she actually believe this? And even though mm. in the final scene where she says, I always knew you were real, like, I'm not even 100% sure if, if I believe that's the case, if that's... I, <laughs> I, no, but it, it, it's, it's like almost as if she's of two minds. No, many people who do see the world in the way she does can believe several things at the same time or can believe that. Yeah. So it, it's, just, it's just really interesting how this, both of these films have this dualism where you have this magical layer that, that at least to me, adds so much additional tension uh, mm. to the films. Well, you'd be interested to hear that this is part of real life and part of John's almost contradictory character. He had been brought up a Catholic and he really often said, you know, I, I um, 16, I threw the catechism in the wastebasket. And he was very um, 
you know, considered himself not a believer in God, but I would say he was a believer in magic. And what I mean by that is I'm someone who experiences in a very real way, and this is dramatized in my one woman show, that I have um, kind of different ages inside me. And I'm very in touch with my child self. And uh, two little stories about John seeing that was he would look at me every now and again <laughs> and he'd say, I can see that naughty schoolgirl. <laughs> because I have a 15 year old kind of personality. And, um, you know, I've, I've found this a lot working with other people as a psychotherapist that there are times of like trauma in your life and it's like a part of you gets stuck. In, in kind of frozen in that age and part of the healing work is like releasing the personality into a healthy aspect at that age so like I have a really healthy seven-year-old inside me who's nothing like the shy little hurt uh, little creature I was at seven and I have a healthy 15-year-old inside me who's not a person that went through all the difficult things I went through at 15. And he he would see her when I mean, he meant naughty, not really naughty, just like lively, if you like. And then one day when we first got a dog, um, I you know I very I very much believe in in, in God, who for me is a feminine God. And um, I talk about the fairies who are like servants to the angels. That's how I that's what I mean when I say fairies. I do believe in nature spirit fairies, but when I say the fairies, it's got a capital F. So here's this. A vowed atheist who talks about God with great division, derision, I mean. I come home from my um, training as a psychotherapist one day, and he and our, uh, our new dog, that I still have, thank goodness, called Pixie, are out on a piece of our grounds, and he's putting stones down on the ground. And I said, John, what are you doing? And he said, Pixie and I are making a path for the fairies. And he was making a stone-lined path uh, across the ground. And of course, the seven-year-old in me went, oh my goodness, <laughs> John, like, understand how important this this." side of life is to me and he included the dog in this endeavor he was doing of making a path for me and the fairies to go down I mean like he was was magical and um, he didn't incorporate it into his way he talked about his own worldview but he entered into my worldview and so it's very real it's very real in the person that he had that magical view of life and was able to bring it to life in his films and I'll tell you a story I didn't know I was going to tell actually because it's quite fascinating he would always say to me there's nothing after death and I'd say to him well you know wait and see John maybe you'll be surprised and um, after his death I divided the house so that I could stay in the house uh, by uh, doing Airbnb downstairs and when I divided the house, literally the day I put the wall up to divide the house, I got terrible pain in my legs in the bottom half of my body. And it went on for over a year. Not as, as intense, but I had pain for over a year. And so uh, in December of the year he died, in September, I went to a family constellation. This is an interesting healing method where the person facilitating set up knows why you've come for help but the people sitting around in a circle don't know anything about you and you choose people to represent you know your father or your mother or your ancestors going back whatever you choose someone to represent they know nothing about you they just see what they pick up so i was directed to choose someone to represent myself and someone to represent male energy so i chose someone to represent myself chose this man to represent john and the man started hopping around in the open circle and he's jumping up and down and he's saying i'm a hot air balloon i'm a hot air balloon i'm not a hot air balloon pilot i'm a hot air balloon and i'm so curious and he spoke like john and this was a mild-mannered person who did lots of meditation he didn't like that normally and then the um facilitator of the consternation directed me to talk to John and the person read to me and people were crying because of how much love was coming out and at the end he said to me 
say to John, I am alive and I dance with death. And he got the John person to say, I am dead and I dance with life. And I went home and I was just laughing and laughing because nobody but John could have said, and I'm so curious. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't as much now, it's five years, but I, I felt him. I felt this person who absolutely believed there was nothing after death. I, I felt him frequently. And sometimes when I'm upset, I can feel him cuddling me. So that it's a good story about the kind of person he was. You know, he was really sure of what he thought. <laughs> and yet if something opened up for him, he was going to go with it because he loved life so much and he was so curious. And um, some weeks after he died, when I was picking him up, he would always say to me, if only I'd met you when I was 50, you know, when he was full of life and strength and sexual being. And if only I'd met you when I was 50. And I'd say, John, I was only 23. We wouldn't have lasted three weeks. Um, but a few weeks after his death, or a few months, I can't remember, I felt him, his energy change from the tired old man he was when he died. I felt him as this lion of a man at 50 years old. That was very special to feel him him change and kind of be with him as that 50, 50 year old that I never knew in real life, except inside him, of course, like the way I was describing about myself. Well, that's a far more extensive uh, answer. Thank you for that, Mary. And uh, I wanted to focus on a part of John's filmography that isn't necessarily so focused on the feminine, because Adam talked about how almost all of his, or all of his favorite films by John uh, have a focus on the feminine. Uh, but one of my favorite films by John is uh, Guns Apatasi. Yeah. Which uh, maybe you could find something feminine, but you know, it, it is almost anything but, you know, with the extremely strong central performance by Richard Attenborough as well, you know, in mm. this. You know, the, almost the uh, personification of the entire British military. So the thing that's just such an um, incredible film and almost overlapping, li tying a little bit over to Rapture as well, this you know, beautiful black and white cinema scope. Uh, mm. You can feel the same kind of visual intensity, even though those films are so incredibly different. Yeah. Do you, do you have any thoughts uh, about Guns of at all? Yeah, I mean, I think John was quite quite like that film and uh, I love that film too uh, and I, he he was I think he was very I mean you, you'll see from his autobiographical essay between bullying schoolboys who didn't understand his French sensitivity and the prevalence of corporal punishment at that time he was badly treated by the masculine and I think that's where his understanding of femininity came from because he appreciated what men are like he understood what men are like when they have power and um guns at, he he would say going into the the war made a man of me he had like this tension between the sensitive child stroke artist and the need to be a man of, among men and you know he was a flight sergeant he did have a crew under him so he felt his ability to survive as an adult he owed a lot to his time in the air force in the company of men so i think guns at Patasi is like his way of like the psychological motive underneath maybe is his way of looking at the issue of masculinity and i love how he sees everyone's different points of view like richard attenborough is a bit of a bully but you can feel sympathy for his love of empire and the queen even though it's outdated and it's going to be overturned and and it's a, a particular historical moment that comes at Batasi captures you don't hate Richard Attenborough, even for his bad treatment of the native soldier at the beginning, you know, his bullying treatment. You you feel with him, I do anyway, feel with him for the, the, the uh, diminution of, I mean, I'm not, not saying how awful things about colonization were, but I think Guns of Patasi is, has those tight, you know, has those kind of tensions and complexities of like just like all the complex issues of attachment to the empire and the new life that Africa wanted for itself. I think it's an amazing, amazing look at that time in history. Yeah, I think that's spot on, Mary. And I think 
I, I'm so glad you mentioned the complexity here as well. It fascinates me about even ties in a little bit with Rapture in that it almost plays out two realities at once here too, where, you know, depending on which viewpoint you have, you can see the film in so many different ways. I mean, you can mm. obviously see Richard Attenborough as the absolute hero and I agree with everything he says. You know, him as, you know, the, <laughs> glorif- like the fantastic glorification of British Empire and just see him as this, you know, wonderful, fantastic, strong character. But then at the same time, you can have exact opposite view and almost see him as a little bit joke. And I really like the nuance and how it played out. And also the mm-hmm. fact that, you know, he does all of these really heroic acts throughout the film and you see how it takes charge and you see, you can understand why he makes the choices he does. And, and obviously his commander commends him for that as well. But at the same time, he could have done absolutely nothing and it would have almost the identical outcome, not spoiling the film, but it's just so interesting that that's the way it was played out as well. Yeah. I, I was also going to say that it's also, I've seen several of his other films as well, the way he humanizes the antagonist so much. Mm. Because obviously, even though Errol John as Lieutenant Boniface is uh, quite strict, quite brutal in many ways, he, he gives so much of his, uh, his own logic to it. You know, you can see and feel his motivations as well. So I, I think it's just to do that. And that's also something, you know, I saw at, what was his name again? Bridges at uh, Ramadan where he has so many very likable people on the German side as well, which you can just see swept up in it and are making really humane choices. It's just really interesting yeah. that you know, when he creates antagonists, he's not necessarily making them into being bad people. He's all, he almost always tries to see their humanity. Yes, no, I think that's a really good thing in John's films, especially <laughs> valuable to Americans right now, <laughs> you know, being able to appreciate the complexity of the human condition and the complexity in having opposing viewpoints, the humanity of people who hold those opposing viewpoints. Hi, Mary. Um, Just a quick question. So I'm a big fan of a lot of John's films. I wasn't as big a fan of Sheena, despite it it had amazing scenery, it had really nice music. (laughs) I didn't, I, I was just curious based on what we've talked about in terms of femininity, I was curious about what you thought of the character of Sheena and how she was portrayed because I felt she was portrayed as a strong woman, but at the same time, the film, she was quite sexualized in it. There was a couple of naked scenes. There was a lot of her riding on a zebra and kind of (laughs) not wearing a lot of clothing. So I was just curious about what your take was on the portrayal of Sheena or what you thought of that film, if you liked the film. Yeah, well, I like aspects of the film. John had a very difficult time with Tanya Robert, who was not clean and sober at the time. And so she was very difficult to film with. So that kind of complicated things, I think. I know that he liked the scene in the pool, that for him it wasn't sexualized. For him it was acceptable was well, was kind of innocent for him and uh, sensual but not over sexualized that's not to say how other people might see it but that's that was his intention i'm pretty sure because i, I don't think he would have liked and still enjoyed that scene if he hadn't felt there was like something poetic about it um i think he definitely did in the in the opening scenes you know where the little girl changes into the strong young woman he was showing that strong side of femininity but when he would talk about film he would talk with a bit of derision for tanya roberts because of what a hard time she gave him about the filming and i think she probably couldn't pull off the vision he had for that part he talked with huge respect about the shaman who was a real princess and a real shaman in in that tribe whatever the tribe was he just loved her and you can see in the film how she has such nobility and dignity and uh, she's such a real person so that's what came to mind when you asked me that that you know i would say almost uh, i mean apart from the horror of getting a phone call and hearing your son being killed and you're on the other side of the world you know that happened like just over halfway through the filming when he didn't like somebody or he felt somebody wasn't putting their heart into it, he had a lot of trouble with that. And he had so much respect and reverence for people who really loved their work. And this is a change of film, but when he talked about Towering Inferno, he was very dismissive of uh, Paul Newman because 
you know, you just took the job for the money, you just go on set and say, okay, what do you want me to do? He wasn't interested in acting in that film. And he just adored Steve McQueen, who didn't fire. He's, Steve McQueen was supposed to play the architect, and he said, I'm not playing the shit part. Um, I want to be the fire chief. Rewrite the script and I'll be the fire chief. And they had to cancel Ernest, Ernie Borgnine's contract, who was supposed to play the small part of the fire chief. And they paid him something like $200,000 not to be in Tower Inferno because they broke his contract. And they rewrote an eight-page part into an 80-page part. And Steve McQueen just, you know, well, without that, what would Tower Inferno be? Steve McQueen like, really did a great job as the fire chief, didn't he? I actually agree with you about the naked scenes in Sheena. I, I do think they weren't sexualized. For me, the sexualized part was Sheena riding the zebra and kind of... <laughs> and up and down. Um, well, I think that may say something about the difference between men and women because I've never yeah. thought of that. <laughs> Maybe that's just my uh, my mind when I watch the film. Sorry about that. Um, but I, I also I also did like the part that you mentioned where it's we see her change from girl to a woman. I thought that part was very good as well. But yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about the <laughs> sexual part. Must be must be my mind when I watch the film. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, you mentioned to Tom that there were a couple of stories that didn't make it into the book. Would you be able okay. to tell us about them? Um, well, the one that comes to mind when you ask me is during the film filming of that dreadful film, El Condor. Jim Brown, who was a retired football player, was really, really heavy. And he, he couldn't get on his horse. And he had to be helped up onto his horse every time there was a scene where he was on his horse. <laughs> That's one little tidbit. Uh, but the other story is that there's a big scene with Native Americans. And there are 200 horses lined up. And at the head of the 200 horses was the actor Chief Ironside, who was quite old by then. And he's sitting at the head of the Indian army on horseback. And it took a long time setting up the shot because there were so many horses. And at last they're ready. And John or whoever does it dropped a white handkerchief to show that the charge should begin. And 199 horses charged forward and Chief Ironside had fallen asleep in sunlight and sunshine and he didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> They had to set it all up again. But John John didn't John really liked Chief Ironside, so the way he told that story was a, appreciating the humour of it. Yeah, he wasn't annoyed about it. Some stories he'd tell me and he'd still be annoyed, uh, you know, forty years later or whatever it was. I think one or two of the other stories I I can tell you this other story, but I did end up putting it in the book. So um I anyways. I can't remember where I put it in the book, but anyway, I did. John had a John hit a two year patch without this is real life, this bit uh, without any work between which film was it? Whatever he did in 1970 and um, House of Cards or something and Skyjack. And he had a penchant for buying large houses that his wife advised him again, but he kept doing it. So he bought this large house in, in Brentwood for the then huge sum of $300,000. And he didn't get any work. And he got really, really desperate because it was a bank loan, needed all this repayment. And then Char Charlton Heston came to him. I'm not sure did, if he'd actually work with him. But anyway, he came to him and he said, uh, I'm interested in you directing Skyjacked. So John described, you know, he had he owed all this money and a two year hiatus in a film director's career can mean the end of their career. So he went to the interview in the Polo Bar at the Beverly Hills Hotel, like full of trepidation about whether he was going to get this job. And he did get the job. So now they're filming Skyjacked and Chuck Heston noticed that every day at five o'clock, John's assistant brought him a brown paper bag and he said, John, what's in that brown paper bag? And John said, it's my scotch. Because apparently filming in America is very, very different from filming in England where people are more open about alcohol. He didn't drink during the day when he was filming, but it was still like a bit frowned on in America. So Chuck said, I'll have one of those. And so every day at five o'clock, the assistant brought two brown paper bags with a glass of scotch in <laughs> for the rest of the filming. 
<laughs> that is a great story, Mary. Mary. Uh, so the pod, the podcast, but I was um, I was wondering if you had time for a couple of quick uh, questions from the forum as well. Sure. Perfect. Uh, take it away, Saul. So. You can ask the first question. Our first question comes from one of our users called Blocko, who's done some podcasting with us before. It's about Death on the Nile, which I think I've said before is my favorite film from John. It's got a really great uh, Nina Rota music score in it. It's got an excellent mystery mm. story in there. And what Blocko wrote is he's curious to what extent John was conscious of the previous pro movie, heard on the Orient Express from Sidney Lumet, and how did it or did it not influence his work on Death on the Nile? And Block has written, he's especially interested in whether he worked with Peter Ustinov on his performance of Perot. Right. So the first bit is, I don't think John paid, not according to anything he ever told me, he, he didn't pay attention to earlier versions. I mean, uh, other people's films at making i don't think I, I think he did pay attention to the earlier version of king kong because he needed to make it really different but that's the only thing i remember hearing about where he paid attention to anything else outside him he had a quite a close relationship with peter ustinov i don't remember if it was outside of this film but i think it was and because um, a lot of these actors did live in the area of los angeles that john lived in so he socialize with them around his pool table and things. Um, but he did tell me that they work together on how to portray Poirot to take advantage of Peter Ustinov's character and how to be different from other portrayals of Poirot. And I know some people like that portrayal more than, than many others, you know. Hey, th thanks, Mary. That's a very interesting response because obviously Albert Finney and Peter Ustinov have given very different performances. Um, I personally both find them both effective in different ways. Uh, I guess we can go to our next question now. So Mary, we have a, a question from uh, Angel Glaz and he's asking, John shot several war films, so was there any particular reason for this? Now, I imagine we have kind of touched on this briefly earlier on, but if, if you'd like to elaborate on it, that would be great. Yeah, I don't know if I know anything about that. I mean, obviously, there's the thing he said himself, that he took the jobs he was offered. I don't think he turned anything down that I know of. I mean, I know he didn't want to make King Kong Lives, for example. He really tried to talk Dino out of making King Kong Lives and failed. So he took the job, even though he knew it wasn't going to work, wasn't going to be a second blockbuster. Remind me of the beginning of the question, because I've diverted myself onto King Kong Lives. <laughs> Um, what was the question again? No problem, Mary. It's uh, oh, war films. War films, yeah. He did definitely have an interest in war films because he loved The Longest Day and he wanted to make Last Days at Berlin, which I think was made some years back by somebody else. He really, really wanted to make that film. And Daryl Zanuck was going to make the film Last Days of Berlin with John. And then Daryl Zanuck got to some kind of dementia and couldn't keep his job anymore. And uh, Richard Zanuck took over and he refused to make it, which was like broke John's heart. He's, he's still talking about it, however well, many years later it was. But he didn't tell me why. I don't know why he was interested in war films. But he was he, he really liked making Blue Max and he really liked making um and, and guns at the Tarzi. I mean he just I think I think he liked the complexity of the human condition and that looking at war was one way to show that complexity. That would be my guess from knowing him. I don't think it was about glorifying violence or anything. He wasn't interested in violence per se. It does sound like a, a great point, Mary, because you can certainly see the complexity in the characters with the war films. They're always brilliant to watch. So yeah, that's um, a great thing. Adam's got a question for you now. Okay, so Insomnius from the forum wants to ask, besides Rapture, what films was John most proud of? I think he, rem, rem, the other, I didn't tell you this the first time around, but he would always say two things when he looked at his film. He'd say, don't remember a single shot and mm, not bad. So he was seeing his films from 50, 40, 30 years earlier with a pretty fresh eye. And and I believe him he didn't remember the shot because I was frustrated he wouldn't tell me more about what it was like to be a director. 
and I'm not sure he'd even seen them after they were made. But oh gosh, I must be getting tired. I've forgotten the first question. Oh, what were his favourites? So I think he, well, you know, we watched Death on the Nile more than once. So I think it's safe to say that he was proud of that one. And he was very proud of the fact that he and his son were able to roam around in the Karnak Temple and they got permission to go on the pyramids and and go up, uh, go up the pillars and drop that stone down like things that he would talk about how uh, you, you can't step on those things now. In, in modern filmmaking, he wouldn't be allowed to do what he was allowed to do. And he was very happy that he'd pulled that off with the Egyptian government and had that freedom and all those wonderful shots on these ancient artifacts. So I know death, I know he enjoyed Death on the Nile. I think he thought like he'd got close to what he was aiming for with his war films. I think particularly Guns at Potassi, but also Blue Max. I think he was quite proud of those. I think he was quite pleased when he saw his very first film, Torment, which, if you haven't seen it, is really worth looking at. Uh, a lot of his films are available for rent now on Amazon in the US. I don't know about in the UK. Torment is one you can see. Um, it's interesting to um, see his style present in his very first film. But I wouldn't say it was one of his favourites, but I think he was thought it was an adequate attempt. He was pretty, nobody's mentioned The Crowded Day. He was, he liked The Crowded Day. The Crowded Day is one of those 50s compendium films that's about five shop girls a day in the life of five shop girls. And um, it's a really good little film. And that's great fun to watch. Those are the ones that come to mind. I might think of something later, but those are the ones I think he liked the best. I think he liked Town on Trial. And he was proud of Town on Trial did for John Mills what Guy Jack did for John. John Mills' career was on the downward slope. And he did, a that for Britain, an unusual portrayal of a police character with a bit more toughness, like a little Americanized, not completely. And um, that turned John, John Mills' career around. Certainly proud of that aspect. And I think he liked that. That film too. Thanks a lot. That was really interesting. I also, I also really liked Town on Trial. I think it's okay. So Saul is going to ask another question from the forum. Sure. So Roger, who's one of our Irish members of the forum, has asked if you've got a particular favourite of John's films outside of Rapture, of course, and why. Well, I might answer differently on another day, but the one that comes to mind today is The Crowded Day. It's partly because of the story in that that's darker than the rest. The story of the shop girl who becomes pregnant and is, is chased by a would-be rapist. And I think it might be because it gives, you see when you read my essay on John's attitude to femininity, it gives me an insight into John. But I always was fond, always am fond of 1950s compendium films. So I would say outside of Rapture, that and Death on the Nile are my two favourite films. And Death on the Nile because it's like so wide sweeping and so sumptuous and the costumes are so gorgeous and the, and I love Agatha Christie mysteries anyway. So really enjoyed Death on the Nile as well, Mary. I watched it just last week for the first time and it was an excellent film. Oh. Not knowing what was going to come next and how it was going to pan yeah. out and really had me on the edge of my seat throughout. Yeah. Um, so I've got um, another question here from one of the forum users, Old Ale One, who really likes the Tarzan film, Tarzan's Greatest Adventure. Mm. And they're curious what John's experience was in working on a franchise film, although it may have been different at the time Tarzan was made from the terms of a franchise film today. And they're wondering what kind of compromises John had to make to keep the film within the spirit of the character, because it's a, a much tougher and more serious Tarzan than usual. And they're wondering if John got any flack for that or if there were other elements of the production that might be harder because of the specific rule. Yeah, that's unfortunately, that's not the sort of thing that he talked to me about. I, I think that you're, you know, I think it was a bit different It's because franch, franchise is a little bit different from the emphasis now on sequels. So I think John felt, as far as I know, 
he was able to make the Tarzan film he wanted to make and the same with Tarzan Goes to India. I think he was quite proud of the fact that Tarzan's greatest adventure is, you know, there's like a critic's consensus that I've read at least that that the best Tarzan film. But the sort of thing he talked about was about little stories that happened when he was filming. He didn't really talk about the nitty gritty of getting production deals or how much freedom he had only to comment how much freedom he had in in Rapture. So he would, you know, he'd tell me about his relationship with Sean Connery and how he said to Sean, if you if you want to make it big in acting, you've got to tone down your Scottish accent, Sean, and things like that, you know. Um and Sean didn't like coming on set and hanging around. So they had this agreement that he could go fishing in the river and John would blow a horn uh, oh, not John, but someone would blow a horn. And when Sean heard that horn, he had to come. And if he came quickly, then it was OK. He could go on fishing. <laughs> but all, all the time they fell in the the crew fell in the river and some of them had a nasty bug from the thing. I mean, he was interested in the people. So he didn't tell me really about the film that I wanted to know about. He'd tell me all these little stories like I just told you. These little stories are just as fascinating, though. So it's great to hear them. Kippenham, um, I don't know if it's Kippenham um or Sippenham, um, but on on the forum, he wanted to ask. So he he's particularly mentioning the Blue Max, which he's a big fan of. But you know, I think it can be a general question. Why do you think a lot of John's films are so underrated or not so well known? I don't know how to answer that. I, well, I, I suppose I have got a bit of the thought that was shared by the people who wrote the book. Uh, I think because his later films were better known, perhaps because of coming out of America, and because he got a kind of reputation that he could do different genres, and that he he was pretty good at bringing films in on time and on budget. He was a great organizer. So I think, you know, he will unfairly be called in certain places a journeyman director, because he could turn his hand to different things, and he could juice. So somehow, the the beauty and artistic vision of his work and the fact that it was that way around, right? He started out in Britain and went to America and Americans, mm, I don't quite know how to put this tactfully, but maybe don't appreciate as much as British people, those kind of subtle, you know, the subtle, I mean, British black and white films of that period are quite different from American black and white films of that period. So, you know, the, the, I'm not sure the American sensibility necessarily appreciated what John was capable of and didn't know and still don't know all the great work he did in, in Britain. So um, I think that's the, you know, that combined with the way he undermined his, you know, he did wouldn't compromise. That's one thing Kristen Berry said to me. He wouldn't compromise. He wouldn't negotiate respectfully. He just got inflamed with when men had power over him, which goes back to the corporal punishment trauma, in my opinion. So he didn't handle things tactfully and well, and he wasn't his own best friend. So between his capability in many genres and dependability, and between his own easily inflamed personality, I think he was like lucky to make as many films as he did, because there's no question he was a very difficult person for people with power to work with. So I think it's amazing how he managed to make so many films. And I, I really hope this book is a step in rewriting his reputation because he absolutely deserves to be recognized as, as one of the great directors, I think, not just as his wife, but just he, he was a real artist. And there was a loss that those factors combined for him not to have the freedom to carry on in what he created in Rapture. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, I know I've become a big fan of John's films over the past few weeks. And I know that all of us on here have watched quite a lot of his films now. And we're trying to spread the word on the forum. We're trying to get as many people as possible to watch more because there's a lot of very great films. I hope the book and other podcasts will help bring more attention to some of his earlier films that aren't so well known. Oh, and just a reminder that John Gillerman, The Man, The Myth, The Movies, is available for purchase on Amazon. Thank you for listening, and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMForum.com. <laughs>